Thank you. <laughs> uh, and thanks very much to Jim and uh, to Antoine for what's been a fantastic conference today. I'm very glad to have been able to be a part of it and to, to listen to all these great presentations today. So um, the uh, title of my talk is uh, Partisan Confrontation and the Permanent Campaign. Scholars and journalists normally attribute rising partisanship to ideological changes within the two parties. There's no question that the two parties have become more ideologically homogeneous internally and that the preferences of Republicans and Democrats, both activists and members of Congress, are far more distant from one another today than they were. But what's often overlooked in this focus on ideology is the closeness of today's party competition. The level of party competition that we have for control of national government today is not normal for American politics. The last three decades have seen the longest period of near parity in party competition for control of national institutions since the Civil War. <clears throat> this figure illustrates this reality. It just displays a very simple index of two-party competition uh, at the national level since 1861. It's just the average of the Democratic Party's share of the two-party presidential vote, its share of House seats and of Senate seats. I then display the index's divergence from a 50-50 balance for each decade. The closer the bar to zero, the more competitive the decade. Democratic-leaning eras are shown in blue. Republican-leaning eras are shown in red. Purple bars indicate evenly matched competition. As is evident here, our politics is distinctive for its narrow and switching national majorities. Nearly every recent election has held out the possibility of a shift in party control of one institution or another. We're looking here in 2014 to the possibility of a, a change in control of the Senate. Looking back, the period most similar to the President was the Gilded Age between 1876 and 1896. This was another era of close and alternating party majorities as well as a ferocious party conflict and low congressional productivity. Ferocious competition for control of national institutions has been an important contributing factor to the rise of party polarization over the past three decades. Parties make an electoral case for themselves by amplifying the differences that voters and other relevant actors perceive between the parties. They want to answer the question, why should you support us and not the other party. In some form or another, the answer to that question has to be because we're different. It, ideally, it would be because we're different and better. Generally speaking, amplifying the differences will involve partisan confrontation. The goal is to communicate party differences to external constituencies. The reemergence of party control, or party competition for control of Congress is undoubtedly one of the most important changes in the American political landscape since the 1970s. For decades before 1980, the Democrats were, to all appearances, simply Congress's natural majority party. Democrats were not just the congressional majority party during this half century. They were an overwhelmingly dominant party a lot of the time, holding on average 60 percent of House and Senate seats and, with some regularity, majorities of two to one. Given such persistent and predictable Democratic majorities, legislative party organization did not appear necessary for Democrats to continue in power. And the stronger party organization seemed unlikely to improve Republican chances of winning a majority. It's not surprising that in such an environment, most elements of the party system in Congress atrophied. Competition is a powerful spur to party organization at all levels. In that sense, 1980 represents a turning point. In the elections of that year, Republicans shocked even themselves by winning a Senate majority for the first time since 1954. This was also the first election since the New Deal in which Republicans captured the presidency with a candidate from the conservative wing of the party. After 1980, Republicans increasingly saw themselves as a fully viable national alternative to the Democratic Party, a party that did not have to settle for minority status any longer. Competition for control of, of the national institutions has been a more or less continuous reality since 1980. Democrats and Republicans have each held the presidency around half the time. Divided government has been the normal state of affairs. Democrats have had majorities in House and Senate for nine Congresses, 
and Republicans have had House and Senate majorities for eight. These margins of control have been narrow by historical standards. So for evidence of these claims, I'm going to discuss two briefly here. One, evidence from internal partisan debates and party reorganizations. And two, uh, the, <laughs> I should have a number two, the uh, <laughs> creation and institutionalization of ex extensive partisan public relations operations in both chambers and in both parties. I'll turn first to the ways congressional party strategies have evolved since 1980. Members of Congress not only have policy preferences, they also have to make strategic choices. One of the most important of these choices is a party's decision about whether or not to participate in governing, or whether instead to focus on setting up clear contrasts on issues for electoral purposes. By participating in governing, I mean a willingness, willingness to negotiate as needed to successfully legislate. For a congressional minority party, this means trading votes of support in exchange for substantive concessions on policy. For a majority party, governing means accepting the compromises necessary to clear veto points of the other chamber and to win the president's signature. What makes this choice painful is that participation in governing almost always has political costs. In a system of divided powers like the US, a party can rarely achieve its goals in an undiluted way. Legislating almost always means disappointing party constituencies. For both parties, achieving the doable means accepting the fact that key constituencies are likely to be alienated, disappointed, and angry. Think just about the example of uh, the Affordable Care Act. You know, this is the most significant expansion of the social welfare safety net since the Great Society. It was passed under unified democratic control with 60 votes in the Senate uh, to, cl to, to clear the filibuster hurdle, and yet it was a, a terrible disappointment for the democratic left. Both majority and minority parties confront this difficulty, but the dilemma is more acute for the party that's more dissatisfied with its share of national power. The minority party cannot usually expect to achieve much by way of its policy goals. Meanwhile, cutting deals that disappoint its base voters is definitely not in its electoral interest. It's more electorally beneficial to refuse deals and to use the time to set up favorable contrasts for the next elections. <coughs> I'll, I'll say, say the quotes for just a minute. The most direct evidence that the era of two-party competition for majority control sparked a change in political strategies grows up out of a decade-long fight among House Republicans through the 1980s. Beginning around 1979, a handful of junior Republicans dissatisfied with their party's minority status began to vocally criticize their party's leaders in Congress for putting legislative compromise over partisan gain. Political scientist Charles O. Jones had described the Republican Party of the 1960s and 1970s as suffering from a, quote, minority party mentality, in which its members had given up on winning majorities and instead just worked to strike the best deals that they could get. The debate over party strategy was crystallized in an exchange in the National Journal in 1982 between Gingrich and uh, Bob Michael. Newt Gingrich saying, best Republican strategy is to recognize that the Democrats run the House and will do all they can to butcher the budget. Bob Michael should relax, concentrate on the impotence of Tip O'Neill, and refuse to take up the burden of being Speaker himself. Michael, still in leadership, I don't perceive my role as taking the budget issue to the voters. I have to look at what's achievable for the good of the country. Gingrich tirelessly organized to bring other Republicans around to his strategic perspective. Intra-party wrangling continued over this basic question uh, for a, a long stretch of time through the, through the 1980s. Hill newspapers continually reported on the fights between the Republicans, Young Turks, and the party's old guard. On a couple of notable occasions, elements in the Republican conference tried to force their own committee leaders, so the ranking minority members on the committees, to stop negotiating with Democrats. The cross pressures were particularly tough on appropriations, where Republicans wanted to use appropriations issues to set up contrast between the parties to say that Democrats were the big spending party, and they needed their partisans to vote against appropriations bills. 
But the appropriators on the committee liked cutting deals to deliver some stuff for their base. And so they, they, they were cross-pressured on that issue. And the, and the conference tried to force them to stop those negotiations. One of those young Turks was Dick Cheney. And here's how he explained his view. Confrontation fits our strategy. Polarization often has very beneficial results. If everything is handled through compromise and conciliation, if there are no real issues dividing us from the Democrats, why should the country change and make us the majority? If time allowed, I could detail some similar shifts in the Senate Republican Party and the Democratic Party, as well as among House uh, Democrats, uh, especially after losing their majorities. I'll just give you one anecdote. So right after losing uh, their majority in the 1980 elections, Democrats held their first ever, Senate Democrats held their first ever party retreat. And so they came together and a pollster, Peter Hart, spoke to them and told them that they were now free from the constraints of governance and they should take advantage of that and they should bring up some issues that would make Republicans bleed a little. And he made a few recommendations about what to do. Byrd then went back and told his, uh, his caucus that what we need is a record of opposition to President Reagan, that this will then give us the issues that we need to take to the elections. That record of opposition, the echoes are very clear to McConnell saying that the number one priority is to the defeat of, the, uh, defeat of President Obama. The, um, the, the decades of, since 1980 have been a remarkable era of growth and uh, institutionalization for party organizations in Congress. The parties now meet at least weekly in both chambers. Party leaders have huge staffs by historical standards. Party leaders and their support staffs organize the production of talking points and fact sheets on all major issues. They coordinate fellow partisans' media appearances uh, in, and floor appearances in support of party positions. They've institutionalized a practice of setting up floor votes to underscore the differences between the parties and to score partisan points. You, this term message vote, the messaging amendments, that this is just a message vote. That, that that's a, you know, if you read any of the Hill newspapers, this is a, a common term of art. If you, re, if you were to read the newspapers in the 70s and 60s, it was not a term of art. You just begin to see that term used in the congressional record. You know, votes are being staged for the purpose of highlighting how the parties are different. There's been explosive growth in the party's public relations capabilities. Um, in both chambers of Congress, the number of people employed by leadership offices has more than doubled since 1980. And half or more of this increase is attributable to the expansion of party's communication staffs. About close, almost half, 45% of all the people working for Senate leaders do communications. Uh, I, uh, I spent some time doing content analysis of all the material put out uh, by all these leadership offices in both House and Senate throughout the 2013 year. It's very depre depressing work. I found that the most, the most common item uh, released by any of these offices is, is something blaming the other party for some bad outcome or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, criticizing them for some other policy position. That you know, lot, but partisan blaming and finger pointing is the, the, is the dominant theme of the material being released from these uh, leadership offices. But basically, the contemporary legislative branch includes a workforce of hundreds of people whose job it is every day to come in to work and think about ways to attack the other side. Uh, since 1980, both parties have built elaborate infrastructures to wage continual partisan public relations warfare against one another. So since the emergence of intense two-party competition for control of national institutions, the congressional parties have organized themselves to engineer high levels of partisan conflict on the House and Senate floor, both in speeches and in votes, and across the new range of news media that cover Congress. <laughs> the, uh, this is a deliberate strategy, uh, one that leaders and members pursue, one that they believe affects their party's collective fate. So it's not just a matter of ideology. Good government reformers have historically ce celebrated the virtues of party competition for purposes of producing accountability and clear choices for voters. But there may be some distinct downsides to competition because politicians face trade-offs between campaigning and governance. This is true generally. This is especially true for out parties. Governing is difficult. 
It involves concessions that disappoint party constituencies. A party that wants to win elections may well be better off promising pie in the sky and refusing to sign off on any difficult deals. The implication is that there may be less bipartisanship in Congress today, in part because the electoral stakes are so high. 